place for the broken, hurt, and scarred. It's a place to find destiny, to fulfill purpose. And when we come together, we come to meet with God. Tonight, if you are seeing someone that you haven't seen in a long time or for the first time or just someone who you may not know, I want you to take a two minutes and just meet five persons and just tell them I'm glad to see you tonight. So you can hug them, you can shake their hands. If you feel as though they don't want to hug, don't force the hug, right? Do the handshake or the COVID wave, you know. Yes, we are so glad that you came tonight and you're in God's house. Our church is titled Influence Church, and that's because God has placed a calling over our church. It's to raise up people of influence, to influence our current and future generations, and to influence people into relationship with God. This year, our theme for the year has been, there is more to grow. There is more to grow. And we've been challenging ourselves to grow Over the last few weeks, we've been covering some of the topics that are really important for our current generation. We are tackling some of the hard topics in terms of the struggles that we face in our 2020 into 2023 and during the last few years, especially with the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. uh, Last week, we spoke from the topic of, I've lost my peace. The week before that, we spoke from the topic of dealing with stress. Tonight, I want to turn your attention to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. You may be familiar with this passage of Scripture. 1 Kings and 2 Kings is in the Old Testament. And we're looking at chapter 19. And we're here in chapter 19, we're seeing the life of one of the great prophets of old, a man by the name of Elijah. Just to set some context before we get into this passage, Elijah just had a face-off with one of the major false prophets and the king of that time, and they worshipped a false god known as Baal, or Baal, as some people would pronounce it. Elijah would have caused drought upon the nation of Israel because they turned away from God. He faced off with over 450 false prophets and On the Mount of Carmel, just before this account that we are reading from, he had a showdown with these 450 prophets, where he said to them, if you pray to your God and he lights this sacrifice on fire, then your God is real. But if he does not do it and I pray to my God and the burnt offering, the sacrifice that is laid on the altar, if that catches a fire, then my God is real. And as the Bible will tell us, they go on to this showdown where The false prophets of Baal, they are praying to their God, they are crying out, they even begin cutting themselves because cutting themselves in terms of this blood sacrifice was a form of worship in pagan times, in old times, and to some extent still is in our modern day. So they started crying out, cutting themselves, begging for their God to light this sacrifice on fire. And for hours they cried out and nothing happened. Elijah, being a little bit boastful, a little bit confident that his God is real, He took water and he soaked his sacrifice. Now, obviously, if you're trying to light something on fire, you aren't going to soak it with water. He soaks it with water and he prays to God. And the Bible tells us his sacrifice lights on fire, proving to the nation of Israel that the God of Israel truly is the real and living God. And as the Bible tells us, after he did that, he vanquished the 450 false prophets, and in the Old Testament, vanquish meant a little bit more, but we'll keep it PG-13. So we're jumping into chapter 19, and that's the preface. That's the mountaintop moment. That's what just happened. That's a victory that happened with this showdown with Elijah and these false prophets. And word gets back to the wife of the king, King Ahab. His wife's name is Jezebel. Maybe you heard that name before, Jezebel. And word gets back to this, the wife's king that she, he just killed all her false prophets. 
She is angry. She's upset. So we're jumping in to see what happens in verse 1 of chapter 19. And it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Speaking of the false prophets. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, sent a voice note, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I am going to kill you. And when he saw that, Elijah arose, and he ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, Lord, it is enough. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Tonight, for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you from the title of When Anxiety Attacks. When Anxiety Attacks. Can you take your right hand, place it over your left heart tonight, and let's go to God and pray. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. If you have a notepad, you can take notes tonight. If you don't, you can take notes on your cellular device, but you're going to put it on airplane mode so there aren't any distractions. When anxiety attacks. I want you to know tonight that anxiety is one of the major tools that the enemy used in the warfare against you and I. Sometimes we can think that the devil is going around like a teenager slashing our car tires, and every time we get a flat tire, the devil attacks me. But the devil is actually much more strategic than the simplicity of your tire going flat. I've changed so many flat tires just about... Maybe three weeks ago, I got a flat tire on the highway just about past Coover, just close to the um, Coover dump area. So the smell wasn't so great. But after changing flat tires for so many times on my van, I made it in 10 minutes. I changed out that tire. It was record time, and I'm proud of myself. So when it comes to the attacks of the enemy, sometimes we think that it's in these minor places, but the enemy is much more strategic. He looks to attack our mind. And the battle oftentimes lies in the war field of our mind. And one of the major tools that the enemy uses is anxiety. John chapter 10 and verse 10 tells us that the devil has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's not here to play around. He's here to destroy your life, your family, your community, your country. He has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Here we find that anxiety is not only restricted to certain people, but anxiety can attack anybody. Any one of us can have a face-off with anxiety. Any one of us can go through a season where the devil uses the circumstances around us and gets into our mind and starts playing with our mind, and anxiety creeps in. Here we find that Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, is fighting with anxiety. He just had a mountaintop experience. He just was victorious over 450 false prophets. He called down rain from heaven. There was a drought on the land, and he prayed, and God sent rain. And even though he was such a great man of God, even though he had such great faith to call down rain in a drought, the fact is that anxiety attacked him. None of us are exempted from the attacks of the enemy. None of us are exempted from the attack of anxiety on our mind. This great man of God, he hears that Jezebel, a woman, and maybe since his father's there, we could say things like this, but maybe women oftentimes cause, gives men some anxiety, right? Okay, we can't say it. All right. He finds out that this, this woman, the wife of the king, gets word of what he has just done, and the woman, the queen, not the king Ahab, the woman sends word to this great man of God, Elijah, that she is going to kill him. 
And Elijah runs for his life because anxiety grips him. And I want you to understand that anxiety can attack any one of us. I thought that anxiety was a new age problem. I thought it was a 2021 kind of problem. I thought it was for our kids who are stuck on their cellular devices, so they have no attachment to the real world, so anxiety just plagues them. But anxiety, anxiety can attack any one of us. For me, I never faced anxiety until my wife was pregnant during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were praying for a while and planning to bring a baby into this world. And when she... When we found out that she was pregnant, it was just about the peak time of the COVID-19 pandemic. There were no vaccines at that time. Our cases in Trinidad was at the highest at that point in time. We were seeing younger people that were passing from the COVID-19 virus. And I'm going to be transparent with you guys. That was the first time that I ever felt the severity of anxiety on my life. Because I was just panicking everywhere that we go, anybody that we interacted with. I was so worried that we may contract the virus and we may lose the baby because we were waiting for this child. We were praying for this child. And I didn't want anything to happen to this child. And I remember there would be nights that I couldn't sleep well because I would feel that anxiety and those thoughts passing through my mind of what if, and if this were to happen, and if we go here, and if we go by family, and if family comes over, or if we're in church and something happens, what will happen to the baby? And it began to cripple my mental space. It began to occupy real estate in my mind that did not belong to the thoughts of the enemy. And before I knew it, the anxiety was having control over me. And I remember praying and asking God, God, you really need to help me out of this place. You really need to help me with this battle that I'm facing. And in that season, God gave me a word from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. And his word brought so much clarity in that moment. And still till this day, I use this scripture every time I feel that fear of death, that fear of anxiety. This scripture brings me so much comfort. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, this is what it says. Paul says, in prison, about to be executed, he says, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I want to speak to those that are fearful of death just for a few moments. Your life belongs to God. Your life is in God's hands. And whether you live or you die, your life will be extended once your life is in Christ. He has granted you eternal life. And Paul says, if I live, well, that is Christ. If I die, then that is gain. What difference does it make whether I live or die? This is what Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 55. He says, O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? Because when Jesus died on the cross for you and I, he defeated hell, death, and the grave. He rose from the dead so that you can have eternal life. You don't have to be fearful of death. You don't have to be fearful of what if I get into the car and I get into an accident? What if someone breaks into my home and they assault me or they kill me? I want you to know that you will live forever in Christ because he has conquered hell, death, and the grave. You don't have to be fearful fearful of that. The reason we don't talk about that is because we fear it most of the times. We don't want to think about it because we fear what will happen after this life, but you have a hope in Christ that after death is eternal life. You don't have to live in that fear. And the funny thing about it is that Elijah is one of the Old Testament prophets that never die. Because in this moment, he's afraid of dying. He's afraid of this woman taking his life, Queen Jezebel, but he doesn't know that he wouldn't even die at all. The Bible tells us that he's taken up by a chariot of fire into heaven. He never faces death. Maybe you won't die either. Maybe Christ might come back. I don't know. But what difference does it make? 
Because if this broken world can be so enjoyable, how much more will a perfect paradise be that God has created for you? Stop holding on to what the world can offer. God has better in store. Perfect heaven, perfect paradise. To live is gain. To die is Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm not afraid of death anymore because Jesus has won the victory. And Elijah gets word that this queen wants to kill him. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, it tells us that upon getting this word, he runs and he goes into hiding. When anxiety attacks, he goes into hiding. Like a turtle, he crawls into his shell. I know we mostly have moracoids and turned out. I didn't know that when I was small. I thought all was turtles. So I thought the little turtle that I caught in the drain was a turtle. And then I wonder why he doesn't go in his shell. But apparently he's a moracoid. But like actual turtle, he retreats into hiding. He runs. And it says that he leaves his servant behind. And he goes a little bit further. And he hides in a cave. And today, being our Father's Day service, I want to speak to the men a little bit because Elijah goes into his man cave. He goes into his man space. He gets into that place of isolation where he does not confront the feelings. He does not confront the emotions. He does not confront the anxiety, but he hides instead. And men have this thing where we think it's too macho to talk about what we're going through. We think it, it's too macho to show vulnerability. So we go into those caves. We go into those hiding places where we don't tell anyone what is going on in the heart of our minds. Some men feel more comfortable talking about their problems with their barber while getting a haircut. Just in case you didn't realize your barber does not have any training in psychology nor counseling. He may not be a Christian, I don't know, but that's the reality because men feel as though they don't want to talk about things. I understand because I do feel the same way at times. I keep things bundled up and I don't want to talk with my wife about it. Part of the reason I don't want to share with my wife is because some of the, some of the strains that I face... I don't want her to have to, to live in that as well. I don't want her to feel what I'm feeling because I feel as though I should carry this weight and she shouldn't have to. And what I've learned in those moments while, yes, I want to protect my wife, uh, there is someone that I can go to because when anxiety attacks, the Bible tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make it known unto God. I can go into a cave, into a secret place, and talk to my heavenly Father and pour it out at the altar because there is a place for my anxiety. I can cast it upon Jesus because he came for me. So Elijah goes into this cave in hiding. And he prays in the cave. It's a messy prayer, but he prays. Look at what it says in um, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verses 4. Verse 4. This is the prayer of Elijah. So he went into the cave and he prayed that he may die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He prays, but it's not the best prayer. It's not the prettiest prayer. It doesn't have the most faith in it. He just prays, God, just, just take me now. Don't let this woman kill me. It's embarrassing for me to die at the hand of this queen. Take me now, God. And it's strange because... He's afraid of death, but then he wants to die. Because maybe he's not so much afraid of death itself, but maybe he's afraid of failure. What does he say? I am no better than my father's. He's afraid of failing his nation. He's afraid of failing his people. 
He's afraid of failing God and failing the call of God over his life. See, his fathers and the king, the prophets before him, they failed in their duty as prophets. And he didn't want to be a failure like them. And I came to tell you tonight, if you feel like Elijah, if you feel as though you're no better than your father and your father, father, and you feel like you failed, I want you to know that God is here to strengthen you. He is here to equip you. If Christ is in you, you're not a failure. You're not a mistake. You have purpose. Greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world. And he prays, take my life. I'm, I'm no better than my fathers. I'm no better than my fathers. And I just want to talk to the men in the house just a little bit because sometimes you can use that same excuse as well. Like, I didn't learn from my father. My dad wasn't a wrong. He left me. I didn't have a great dad, he abused me. And for too long, you've been selling that narrative that I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know how to be a husband. And when you come to Christ, all those generational curses are broken. When you come to Christ, you have a heavenly father that is able to teach you all things that your earthly father failed to do. The Bible tells us if your earthly father knows to give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give to you? Men, stop making excuses. You can do better because God lives in you. You can go to your heavenly father and say, mold me and shape me into your image, into your likeness. I want to represent you, Jesus. You are my father. You are my teacher. You are my guide. He says, I'm no better than my fathers. It's time we stop using that excuse. I'm I'm no better than my father. I'm no better than what has gone before me. Every generational curse has already been broken. And your heavenly father lives inside of you. So Elijah prays this prayer. I'm no better than my father. End my life now. And as he prays this prayer, even though that anxiety is there, something miraculous happens. Because in verse 5, it tells us that he falls asleep, and an angel of the Lord appears unto him. And the angel says to him, Arise, eat and drink. And prepared before him is a meal of cake and water. Now, if you don't know Elijah, you don't know that cake is like his KFC. He loves cake. All right? Every time you see the Elijah in the book of 1 Kings, he's eating cake. He goes to a widow's house and he, she, he says to her, bake me a cake. He likes cake. Or maybe that's all they had back in that time. I'm not sure. But there's a meal prepared for him because... In those moments when you pray, no matter if the prayer isn't pretty, God always sends a way of escape. I remember when my wife and I were getting married, we wanted to have a really exotic type um, engagement photo. So we wanted it to be on the beach, on some place that wasn't common, that had some nice scenery. So the week before going to do our photo shoot, I took a couple of my friends who goes hiking often, and I told them, show me some of the the exclusive spots on the north coast. So we'd go and we'd choose one of these spots to be that place where we take our photos. So it was a Thursday evening. We all loaded up in my van that is a supposedly 4x4 vehicle, and we headed up the north coast. And one of the guys, he was showing us different spots. And then when we were almost to Blanche Shares, he said, there's one last spot. It's a little bit hard to get to, but it's beautiful. So I said, okay, let's go. So we continue driving. We pass over the spring bridge. I didn't know you could drive there, but we did. We drove over the spring bridge. And we continued up into the mountains on that Blanche Shares stretch. And eventually... We reached a slope where in front of us was muddy. It was so muddy that for sure, if I tried to drive with my vehicle, we would have been stuck in the mud, guaranteed. 
The problem was, there was nowhere to turn. Somebody didn't leave their garage gate open for me to turn in, right? There was nowhere to turn. On one side was a mountain, and the other side was a cliff. And the bottom of the hill where the mud was, it was a corner. So there was no way for that 4x4 van to turn. Now, I should also let you know that I said I supposedly have a 4x4 van because my four-wheel drive has not been working for the last three years. So now we're there, and we have to reverse up the hill that we just came from, but it's not no nice pitch road. It's actually carved out stone, so there's no grip whatsoever. And every time I try to reverse, the van begins skating off the side of the cliff. My grandmother looks really worried. I'm alive, Grandma. I start sliding off the cliff, and I have to stop because if I keep going, I get slides completely off. And we just go back and forth up that little cliff, taking any little broken pieces of wood, trying to get traction for four hours straight, we were just stuck. Couldn't go anywhere. And I had just reached, into the point, reached to the point where I had just given up. There was no other options. There was no cell service. And I just didn't know what to do again. I had given up completely. And just when I had given up, randomly, a guy comes driving out of the area we were heading to in a 4x4 Hilux just like what I was driving, but with a real 4x4. He drives through the mud that I didn't drive through because I knew I would have got stuck in it. And when he drives through, we immediately flag him down and we say, we've been stuck for a while, could you help us, pull us out? This guy doesn't have any rope in his van. I have some tin tin rope that is probably used to, I don't know, wrap gift paper or something. <laughs> a Kataino Kawada rope. We just like fought to pull up this rope into a whole set of strands and tie it from one vehicle to the other. And this guy pulls us all the way up. While we're going up, the ropes are just bursting strand by strand by strand. And when we reach exactly to the top of the hill, the last strand breaks, but we safely reach to the top of the hill. We're able to turn around. We're able to come out. The guy that was there, he said he was doing some gardening. So... I don't know where he was planting, but I'm grateful he was there that day doing his gardening. And I tell you that because even in the most unlikeliest places, and while that might seem like an abstract story, when we look at the story of Elijah, he's in the most unlikely place, but God shows up and makes a way. He provides sustenance for him. And I just want you to know tonight and be confident tonight that in your darkest moments, in your loneliest days, that when you call upon the name of God, he's a very present help in your time of need. He will show show up. He will make a way. He will provide. He will do miracles. He will part the Red Sea. He will help you to walk on water. God will make a way. And the angel shows up and he, he tells Elijah, arise and eat. Because just like the Snickers at this man, when you don't eat, you can't think straight, right? He tells him, arise and eat. And in that moment when he eats of this bread, this cake, and he drinks of this, this water, for some reason, it brings a little bit of strength into his spirit. And I want you to know tonight, if you are down, if anxiety has attacked you, then God is saying to you tonight, arise and eat. See, Jesus is the bread of life. And you can come to God in your lowest moments and say, God, I want to be sustained by you. I want to be filled by you. I'm going to eat from the bread of life. And he eats that bread. And the angel tells him, go, carry on, and go a little bit further. And the Bible tells us that he goes in the strength of that bread that he just ate for 40 days' journey. And he gets to a place. And at that place, he goes into prayer. And I want to show you this. We're jumping back into verses 8 to 16 of 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 8 to 16. He goes a little bit further. Remember, he, he's still in that place where he's fearful. He's still in that place of uncertainty. Anxiety has attacked him. 
And it says in verse 8, He went and he arose and he ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb and the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and God said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have torn down your altars. And they killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. Now I just want you to just, just to tell you a little background right here. Even though Elijah is selling that narrative to God. And probably he's believed him at it himself. Historically, he was not the only prophet left. There were almost 300 prophets in hiding at that time, which he was aware of. But somehow, he convinced himself. He convinced himself that he was alone. Somehow, he convinced himself that he had no support system, that there were no church community that could understand him, that there were no brothers and sisters in Christ that were praying for him. Somehow, he convinced himself and said, I am alone, there is none left. And maybe you've done the same thing and I came to tell you tonight, you are not alone. There is a community of believers that is here to support you, to pray with you, to stand with you. You are not alone. So he prays and he says, God, I'm, I'm alone. All of them are dead. I'm the only one left standing. And then God said to him, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord will pass by. And the great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But again, the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. And for certain, I would think if God appeared in a fiery burning bush unto Moses, he would be in the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a still, small voice. We ended worship tonight by saying, be still and know that he is your God. And in the stillness, God speaks to Elijah. And it says, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out, and he stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly that voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. <laughs> it's like the same exact thing he just said, right? I don't know, sometimes when we get caught in anxiety, we start to repeat the same, the same narrative, the same lies of the enemy over and over and over. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, they've torn down your altars, and they've killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left, and I seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, what did he say? He said, go. He didn't say, I'm sorry. He didn't, he didn't say, poor you. He says, go. Yeah, anxiety has attacked, but go. Yeah, there's a queen that wants to kill you, but go. Yeah, there are pressures and strains, and yeah, there are bills to pay, and yeah, you might not be well, but go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah. You shall anoint him as prophet in your place. 
He's been fighting with anxiety. He's been fighting with fear. And when God speaks in the stillness, he gives him purpose and tells him, press on. And when anxiety attacks you, you got to press on to your purpose and call in God. God is not telling him, well, you take a break and you sit down and you cry a little bit longer. He's telling him, no, you go. You go back to where you came from. And you anoint some people because that's what you've been called to do as a prophet. To anoint kings and to anoint prophets and to speak the word of God and to say, thus says the Lord, when you're faced with anxiety, you got to get up and follow the call of God over your life. Because the power that anxiety has comes from the realm of the unknown. It's all about what if. What if this happens? What if I die? What if I lose it? What if I end up alone? What if this relationship is too broken to be repaired? What if they leave me? What if I lose my job? It's always in that place of unknown that anxiety draws its power. So as a believer, you got to focus on what you know in those seasons that you're faced with the unknown. What does Elijah know? I have a calling. I have a purpose. God has spoken a word over my life. I'm not going to be focused on what is if Elijah, uh, what if Jezebel kills me? I'm going to be focused on what God has said for me to do. You got to follow what you know God has already called you to do. He's called you to be a father, then be a father to that child. Don't focus on the failure of what if I don't know how to raise this child? What if I'm not able to provide? No, God has called you. You focus on that calling. Focus on that purpose that God has placed over your life. Because if he has called you, then and he will equip you, so don't be attacked by anxiety, but follow the plans of God. And it's really beautiful how this passage ends, especially with our Father's Day service, because he goes and he returns. And check out the first thing that he does. Now, he's given instructions to anoint two kings and one prophet, right? Elisha to be the prophet that succeeds him. Two, three, three persons. But look at the first thing that he does. So he goes on now, and we're jumping into verse 19. He's already been given the instructions. First King chapter 19 and verse 19, it says, So he departed from there, and what is the first thing he did? He found Elisha. Now that was the last thing that God sent him to do, right? Was to anoint two kings, and then anoint the prophet Elisha to be the one that replaces you. But when he gets back to Shaphat, he, to, he, founds, he finds Elisha, the son of Shaphat. And Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. And then Elijah passed by, and he threw his mantle on him to signify that he was passing on the call of God to be prophet over the nation from him to Elisha. This would be the beginning of Elisha's training. The Bible tells us in that moment that he leaves what he's doing, and he starts following Elijah to be trained by Elijah. Now, I know it could get a little bit confusing, right? Confusing. But Elijah is the one that calls Elisha. Elisha comes after Elijah. And I know you might be thinking, was that his son? Because they share such a close name. Did he name his son Elisha? It was not his son, biologically, but that moment, Elijah became a father. After all the anxiety, all the fear, he came and he chose Elisha, anointed him as prophet, and he began training this young man, developing him to be the next prophet that stands over the nation of Israel. And fathered isn't always biological. And I thank God uh, I have a biological father, but I thank God for all the spiritual fathers that have invested into my life over the many years. And some of the guys in this room, maybe you already think your kids are too much for you to handle, but maybe God has some more young men, 
some more teenagers, some more kids that he wants you to be spiritual fathers to, that he wants you to train and to develop and to pass on all that he has equipped you with, all that you have learned into this younger generation. Yesterday we had our youth meeting, and in that space we are trying to pass on to this generation something of value because the society that they live in does not offer them anything of value. And we have a responsibility to pass on that value to the generations to come. I'm not just speaking to the men in the house. I'm saying that we all have a responsibility to pass on something of value to the generations to come. Whether it's your child, whether you brought that child into the world or not, you have a responsibility. If God has placed some things in your life, if God has taught you some things over the years, then pass it on so that it can be a blessing to the next generation and the generation after that. Don't let it die with you, but let it be a legacy. And Elijah becomes a father. Takes on Elisha trains Elisha, and Elisha goes on to do twice as much as Elijah ever did in his ministry. And I think for every father in the house, that would be the summation of what you desire for your children. What you desire for your spiritual children that you would take under your wings. That it would not be less than you, or not that they could never be as good as you, but instead they would do even greater than you could have ever done. He does twice the miracles, twice the signs, twice the wonders that Elijah ever did. That is the call of fatherhood. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. People say that Jesus, uh, Jesus was never a father on this earth, but he was a father to his disciples. And he said to them that you would do even greater than me. Imagine that. The God of this world upon the face of the earth says to you and I that you will do even greater in his name. And his disciples go on to do even more than Jesus had done in that true years of ministry. Because that is the heart of a parent. That's the heart of fatherhood. But if you are too busy and too consumed with everything else, with the anxiety if you're too consumed with fulfilling your duties and making sure you clock in those 24-7 days a week, overtime, etc., 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 then when would you invest into the best investment that God has placed into your life? When you would impart to those kids, maybe it's not your kids, but when you would you invest into their lives if you're always consumed by things that is not placing value into the future generations to come. And Elijah, in all that he could be doing, he takes the time first to choose Elisha, who would succeed him and carry on the mantle of prophet. Tonight, I don't know what anxiety that you face, but when you face anxiety, you can call upon God and he will be a very present help in your time of need. I don't know what you face right now, but God is saying it's time to go and to follow his call, his plans for your life. It's time to stop being stuck in that place that you've been in. It's time to come out of that cave and to follow the call and purpose of God because you have people in your life that God has called you to be a blessing to. So wherever you're at right now, whatever space that you're in, tonight God is saying it's time to go and follow what he's called you to do. I want to invite you to stand all around this house tonight. I started off by saying that anxiety is one of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses. And maybe the devil has been attacking your life and your mind, your thoughts with all the what-ifs. And you found yourself feeling anxious. I want to remind you tonight that God has said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds against the attacks of the enemy. That is what we need to fight anxiety. We need our minds and our hearts 
to be guarded against the attacks of the enemy. So I want to ask right now with all eyes closed, with all heads bowed, as you take time to focus on God tonight, as you take time to place your heart in Jesus, Elijah was told to be still, a still small voice. It wasn't in the wind and the fire and the earthquake, but in the stillness God spoke to him. And anxiety makes us feel as though we can never stay still. Our heart is always racing. Our thoughts are always running ahead of us. And tonight God is saying, just be still. Be still. And listen to my voice as I lead you. Be anxious for nothing, but pour it out on the altar. Pour it out to Jesus. You can tell your heavenly Father all that you feel. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets and he prayed, God, take my life. I've had enough. I'm no better than my father. You don't have to be embarrassed by your feelings. You don't have to be embarrassed by those thoughts. You can tell it to God. He cares for you. He understands. And he is here to strengthen you, to sustain you, so that you can carry on. You can go forth into all that he's called you. So tonight, let's go to God and pray. And let's just seek his face for his spirit to fill us tonight, to strengthen us, and to bring that peace that will guard our hearts and minds against the attacks of the enemy. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. God, you know each person in this house. You know their heart. You know exactly what they face right now. You know the anxiety that troubles their spirit. Maybe if they, they just had some great mountaintop moments like Elijah. They have some great testimonies, but after the testimonies, there was some testing that brought on anxiety. Fear of death, fear of failure, fear of the unknown. And tonight, God, we are coming to you. For God, when we are anxious, we can bring it to you, Jesus. So we bring it to you when we lay that anxiety at your feet, God. God, we don't have to be fearful of failure because we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Tonight, God, I pray that by your Spirit, you will bring strength, sustenance to each person in this house. For you are the bread of life, God. In their weariness, in their tiredness, in their depression, God. Bring strength now by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, speak to them now in that still small voice, saying, go, be a dad. Go, be a mom. Go, be a husband. Go, be a wife. Go, fulfill purpose. Go, be an influencer. Go, and do all that God has called you to do. That still small voice, God, speak to them now, that they can get up and go. They can get up and go into the purpose of God, to walk in the fullness of all that you've called them to do. So I thank you now, Jesus, for hearing this prayer tonight. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to every heart in this house. Spirit of Jesus, just fill each vessel tonight, God, that, Lord, they will do greater things in your name than they ever thought possible, God. That, God, they would impart into others, God. That they will start teaching, training, God. Others, oh God, who can carry on the mantle, carry on the call, and do even greater than what we have accomplished in your name, Jesus. So we thank you now, God, for hearing this prayer tonight. We thank you for blessing every heart and every home right now. For the stillness that comes now in your presence that they will not leave here anxious any longer, but the peace of God will guard their hearts and their minds from the attacks of anxiety. In Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.